The Unshackled Waves, episode 226. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. Now, uh, post the Christchurch mosque shooting, there's been demands from the left and the media for a far-right crackdown, and in the left and the state sites for uh, some time now has been Blair Cottrell, most well known as the leader of the United Patriots Front. I last spoke with Blair at the public launch of the Lad Society, but a lot has changed since then, so I thought I'd invite him back on the show for a catch-up. Welcome, Blair. Thanks, mate. Very bold of you to let me speak. Yes. Well, that's what I want to talk about first, that the you're pretty much banned from the mainstream media now. And of course, this happened a number of months ago now, uh, late July, I think it was, when you appeared on Adam Giles' show on, on Sky News. And uh, you were interviewed by him for about uh, 10 minutes. And I watched it live. And in my opinion, you were articulate you didn't say anything that would be considered extreme uh, but I remember I checked Twitter three hours later and uh, because I was researching another article at the time and I saw Nazis trending on Twitter and I pretty much knew right away what that was so first describe the lead up and then the aftermath uh, well I did nothing to engage with Sky News they contacted me they asked me to come on to a live program uh, purely because they struggled to find anyone from the uh, quote-unquote conservative right who would actually uh, be willing to voice the opinions that come from that realm of politics and bear all of the harassment that comes from the left as a response. Um, they set it up, they told me what time to be there, and I just did what they asked me. Um, I think because I was so reasonable and articulate, actually some media watchdog ruled that uh, there was no breach of, of any of any moral or ethical rule by having me on there. It was the ACMA or something like that. Yeah, ACMA. Yeah, yeah. They um, they ruled there was actually nothing wrong with my interview. But uh, because I came across so reasonable, it's, uh, it normalises nationalism in Australia. And uh, the media and the institutional leftist powers cannot have that. They need to have people continuing to believe that there is some kind of uh, white supremacist, neo-Nazi conspiracy to turn everyone who's not white into lampshades. And so when someone like me goes on television and actually uh, presents totally logical and reasonable uh, points of view and represents the nationalist side of politics, well, they have to uh, defame my character and do everything possible to prevent me from, uh, from, from my message or prevent my message from reaching the public. And so that's what the reason for their hysteria was, in my view. Well, Sky put out a statement on the Sunday night around 10 o'clock saying it was wrong to have Blair Cottrell on the show, and they said they were going to be launching some inquiry about uh, how you came onto the show, which was quite funny that they, they, they didn't know how you came on the show. Yeah, well, it just shows there is some loose ends in, well, at the time at least, there was some loose ends in media organisations and some colleagues of journalists that perhaps they didn't have direct control over. And it was a colleague of uh, Adam Giles himself who approached me, who who got me in contact with Adam Giles, and then everything uh, fell into place from there. And of course, he got sin bin to his show for uh, a number of months. He's back on Sky now, but his, his show uh, is is not there. They officially banned you from the network. In fact, they, they virtue signaled that, saying we're the only network that's uh, banned uh, Blair Cottrell. Yeah. You know, well, it's what can be expected, I suppose, if you're going to be if you're going to be as um, as reasonable as I am, like I said, from this side of politics, then then you're a problem for the establishment. But uh, a month ago, you appeared on 3AW with, with Neil Mitchell. Uh, this was about the, the Dandyman confrontation. Now, you've uh, addressed that on other programs, so I'm not going to um, discuss it uh, with you now. But because he was having a go at you and saying, you know, what gives you the right to decide what's in public, because it was a hostile one where Giles, a lot of people thought he was, he was way too soft on you, that that's probably what sort of made people really outraged about the interview he was definitely easy on me in uh, the sky news interview referring yes to he definitely went easy on me i was actually surprised usually i, I just have to explain why i'm not a racist or a neo-nazi mm -hmm. that's what the entire interview consists of but to to be actually asked my opinions on relevant and 
important political matters and have the opportunity to give my opinions on them was actually refreshing and a nice, uh, you know, a, a pleasant surprise. But uh, he probably could have been a little harsher on me and asked me to explain a few things about my personal past to keep the left happy. But I'm not, uh, I'm not a big fan of appeasing the left, so I, I really can't criticise him. I, 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 but I will say that he was definitely mm. went easy on me, yeah. And uh, I'll add in because whenever anyone interviews Blair, there has to be a lot of disclaimers. You've addressed your, your past on other shows, uh, James Fox Higgins and on Dear Beltran. So if people want to know about that, uh, they, can, they can view that. I'll provide a link to it. Sure. Now, uh, you've also been comp nearly completely deplatformed from all mainstream social media. You had 25,000 Twitter followers before it was permanently uh, suspended. Now, the first uh, Twitter ban came after the uh, Sky interview where one of the, the Sky personalities who uh, lashed out at you the most was, was Laura J. She called you a fascist uh, asshole and did a monologue the next day uh, pretty much saying the same. And you put out a tweet saying, given my treatment by, by Sky, Moza will have raped her on the, on the air. And uh, that, that even sent in everyone into even more of a tailspin. Yeah, well, uh, I was surprised because I didn't meet Laura J. So I think mm. she's based in Sydney. I don't think I've ever met her before. And so for her to call me a fascist asshole, I, I thought was pretty antagonistic. And I don't ever really react out of emotion or impulse. Mm. However, sometimes I know that it's necessary to say something cheeky or a little bit too far, but there's sometimes a fine line between, you know, uh, you know, abrasively cheeky and sometimes a little bit too mm. far. And I think I deleted that tweet after about two minutes because I realized it might be a bit much. But it was it was up long enough for the uh, the uh, Twitter feminists to get a screenshot of it, and, and Twitter still banned me even though I deleted it. Well, they suspended me at that point for about a week, I think. And she reposted herself, and it quite amused me in the replies. People saying that, "Oh, I hope your workplace is safe, Laura Jays. Your employer should be looking after you." Yeah, it must be terrifying for poor Laura Jays. Yeah. Uh, you also got suspended again for um, another uh, rape uh, tweet uh, where there was a poster for a girls' school which said, uh, girls unstoppable, and you tweeted, except walking through parks at night, which yeah. is... Uh, I was actually with a female colleague uh, near Chadston. Mm. We'd been out for dinner, and uh, I, I saw a billboard advertising a girls' school, and it said, girls unstoppable. And I repeated the phrase to my female colleague. I said... Yeah, except when they walk through parks at night. And I think they'd recently been uh, a rape and murder of a woman in a park. Mm. And uh, the woman I was with, or the girl I was with, burst out laughing. <laughs> and I thought, well, if she thinks it's funny, maybe it is funny. So I posted it to Twitter, but uh, I don't think much of the Twitter community found it that funny. And uh, I don't... Was I suspended for that as well? I yes, you were. I, I, was, I can't remember, but yeah. So that was another... I suppose that was another mistake on my behalf. Yeah. Just not really knowing the line between cheeky and too far. Yeah. Do you realize, uh, obviously you send out a lot of controversial tweets, uh, do you realize that sometimes you're feeding people's perception of you? Because obviously there's, there's a lot of people who know you on a, on a personal level, but sort of when they just hear all the bad things about you in the media and then they see those tweets, they sort of, it sort of reaffirms? That has been the, the main and probably most legitimate criticism of me by my closest colleagues. And probably, yeah. Uh, sometimes like as though as I said it's uh it's it's just the um the the autistic inability to see to, to decide what is what is just too far or to, to know what is just too far sometimes yeah so uh sometimes I make mistakes and I'm known for being bold and outspoken and yeah, so sometimes things I say get me into trouble but, yeah let's go over to you had a Facebook uh, page for a while you were your first uh, first Facebook page was deleted in 2017 along with the United <coughs> Patriots Front Facebook pages. Uh, you were allowed back on, uh, I think at the beginning of 2018, then then you lost it. I've, I don't recall for any reason. Do you, were you, do you think you know a reason or they just pulled the plug again? It's pure censorship uh, in 2017. I think it was in early 2017. The United Patriots Front Facebook page was deleted. Uh, along with every account associated with the admin panel, deleted with no reason given as to why. I think these days when your account is deleted, you're given the opportunity to recover your photos and whatever you had on there. But back then they didn't have that, that option. So lost everything from my personal Facebook account as well. 
and uh, I couldn't make another account for six months. I, I think there was maybe an IP ban or something. And I'm not really computer savvy, and I don't think it's worth. I don't think it's worth me trying to hide behind whatever the people make firewalls and VPNs. So I don't try and do that. Uh, but eventually, the uh, IP ban or whatever it is must have been lifted because after about six to eight months, I was able to make another account. That lasted for probably four to five months. Uh, I spent half of that time at least on uh, post blocks, uh, accumulated another couple, of, maybe twenty or thirty thousand followers, and then was deleted again for no reason. And uh, since then, I haven't been able to get onto Facebook at all. Not even through, um, not even through what they call sock accounts or fake accounts. Yes, because you were using your father's account to uh, just see what was on Facebook. That was successful for a number of months, but post the St Kilda political meeting, that got uh, permanently uh, deleted. Yeah, um, very interesting how we were treated. Uh, the, the level of censorship that we experienced in trying to promote the St Kilda rally mm. and how that rally was misrepresented grossly misrepresented by the media trying to suggest we were starting a race riot that we were neo-nazis out to stir up hate merely for the sake of doing so uh, what was really uh, telling was a statement i made uh, making it clear that i wasn't even rallying against africans specifically mm. but against a media government alliance which was uh, covering up their crimes and calling anyone racist for, for noticing that there is a, an african crime problem in melbourne uh, so the rally I stated was actually against the uh, the media government establishment, not against Africans. And that post was uh, deleted and had me uh, temporarily suspended from Instagram. So uh, the uh, uh, this is actually quite consistent. Uh, I've noticed it's quite consistent over the past 12 months. Uh, whenever I actually take a logical standpoint and provide real information about why we are rallying, uh, I'm censored and the media instead tells you why I'm rallying, tells you that I'm actually rallying because I'm trying to spread hatred and racial division just because I want to do that because I'm a bad person. And that's what you're expected to believe. Usually the reason I, I call people to a public space is to legitimately and peacefully protest some sort of government policy or the structure of the government itself, or perhaps, perhaps the alliance the government has with the media, as I just stated before. But uh, that, that sort of uh, censorship, as I said, has been consistent uh, before any of our events, even private events that we've tried to advertise in private groups throughout the past uh, six to 12 months. But uh, my colleague, uh, Neil Erickson, who was, uh, who was actually hosting that St Kilda rally, uh, his Facebook page was uh, brazenly shadow banned. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. One post reached, uh, I think about 50,000 people and about an hour later, his next post reached eight people. And uh, from then on, nothing posted from his main Facebook page got any reach. Yeah, yeah. even we were, uh uncertain at the time post St Kilda with the Unshackled's Facebook present we sort of disappeared for a few hours which which was quite alarming but then we came back and there was no explanation so definitely post St Kilda there was a lot of pressure on the social media companies. It's really not hard to understand it's it, you've got to put yourself in the position of the enemy you've got to imagine that if you were a communist uh, with uh, in a bureaucratic government or media position and you had this influence over social media uh, uh, power or social media institutions, whatever you want to call them, then you'd be doing the same thing. You wouldn't allow these dissidents to be gaining traction. You want to maintain your power, your, your authority over, or institutional authority over the, over the general population. And so you're not going to, you're not going to give any platform to, to your, to your political opponents. Yeah. So if I was in their position, I'd probably be doing the same thing if I were a communist. And so I suppose that's why I'm never really shocked to experience any censorship or oppression because I can, I can think like a communist. <laughs> And as you mentioned, you lost your Instagram account. That was also for no reason. You never really posted anything no. controversial there. It was just photos. But that's, that again is uh, links into the hysteria about Sky News. My Instagram account, I, I mostly just used to post pictures of myself at work, at mm. the gym, with friends, sometimes to, uh, to, sh to share some screenshots of some of my tweets. But it normalized me. It made me out to be just a regular tradesman who was not who clearly was not a skinhead or a member of any white supremacist groups and uh again that presents a problem for the establishment because when they're trying to convince the uh, the majority population or anyone who takes an interest in me that i am a, a, a an innately evil uh, uh you know neo-nazi motivated by nothing but race hate and then you look at my instagram account and i'm actually just a, a carpenter from the southeastern suburbs who enjoys going to the gym and, and occasionally sharing his views about the current political situation, 
well, it kind of makes the media look, look like fools, doesn't it? It doesn't really fit the bill. So it's, it, they can't have me normalizing myself. This is a problem for them. I, I'm a villain and I have to be prevented from being able to present myself as what I really am. They need to be uh, in total control of how I am presented to the public. Whatever they can't control will be shut down and it'll be interesting to see if this video, once you upload it, remains on whatever platform you upload it to. Oh, well, they, they won't be able to wipe it from our hard drive, so, or well, not yet. <laughs> now, you mentioned uh, that you're, you're often cast as a neo-Nazi white supremacist, but one of the, the last tweets that you sent out was a quote from Hitler about uh, talking about uh, demographics and um, ethnicity in one country. That was one of your last tweets, and a lot of media outlets said, see, like we were right all along, he is a a neo-Nazi. Why did you send that tweet out? It's interesting that, uh, uh, that as soon as you uh, understand or appreciate a single aspect of Hitler's philosophy or anything involved in, a, in, in National Socialist Germany, then you're immediately considered a Nazi. I mean, do you drive a Volkswagen? If you do, then you're a neo-Nazi because that was invented by the Germans during the second, or well, in the lead up to the Second World War. Quote itself was uh, that, uh, if I remember correctly, it comes from uh, Hitler's book he wrote in Landsberg Prison, I believe, in 1923. Uh, he was in prison for about nine months uh, after being found guilty of contributing, at least, to, uh, I believe, what was the murder of some police officers, at, uh, or at least the assault of some police officers at, uh, at the, uh, the attempted uh, violent revolution or, or forceful revolution. But anyway, the quote itself was... Uh, uh, if only one nation uh, maintains its identity while all other nations or, or countries in the world uh, mix with each other, then the nation maintaining its identity must, with mathematical certainty, rise to become master of the world. It's a very interesting perspective and philosophy, and it's almost prophetic if, if you consider the uh, world affairs right now. There are probably only uh, a couple of nations or a, few, a handful of nations which are maintaining their national identity ethnically. If we look at the entire West, we, we can't argue that a single Western nation is doing that. Uh, maybe some Western nations in Eastern Europe are, um, are urging, are making more of an urge towards recognizing themselves as an exclusive ethnic collective. But the West generally is all uh, allowing itself to be mass miscegenized or, or mixed with other nations through mass immigration. And this is, uh, according to this philosophy uh, of Hitler's philosophy, uh, going to result in uh, all of the West being subjugated by other nations. And whether or not it's totally irrelevant, like the fact that Hitler said this, uh, I asked the audience just to objectively consider the, the, the points. And uh, many people did, and many people in the comments agreed with it. So it wasn't, wasn't really a, 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 a tweet of praise or support for Adolf Hitler, the man. It was just something he said once, which is, I think, very interesting and applicable to the, to the current political climate. So, in your opinion, it doesn't matter who, who said that, it's just something to consider. And based on what you've said there, you're, you're not going to be bound by what the, the mainstream think that you should phrase things. Well, everyone has something to learn from. I mean, I probably learned more from the communists, actually, and from uh, Trotsky, Lenin and Marx than I did from Hitler. I read more on them than I did... Uh, I learned more from, from, the, from the communist regime and about USSR specifically than I did about National Socialism. Actually, I think that Hitler le learned the majority of what he knew about propaganda and authoritarian uh, government from the communists, uh, with the you know, obvious exception that he believed that uh, race and racial preservation was important, whereas the communists didn't employ any such uh, philosophy. But everyone, the point is that it doesn't matter whether you, you think a regime or a person is good or evil, everyone has uh, something that you can learn everyone has written down something or has every great leader or ruler or anyone who had any sort of power at any, sort, at any, any place in time ought to be studied and learned from regardless of like what's a, what the system tells you to believe or what the system tells you you're not allowed to read. Let's go back to the political meeting at St Kilda Beach. Now that was, there was a talk online a lot from uh, Australian nationalists because uh, St Kilda Beach, uh, that was a hotspot for 
uh, crimes happening by youth described as being of African in appearance. And there had been a lot of talk of having citizen patrols uh, down there. But what uh, led to the, the meeting taking place was when uh, Neil Erickson and Ricky Turner went down to St Kilda Beach themselves and they filmed uh, some African youths playing soccer on the on the foreshore and police told them to move on and when these youths realized there was a camera there that sort of escalated the situation and then uh, Neil said that oh, we're going to have a rally there next uh, Saturday and you were uh, drafted into it you weren't an organizer for it but you were the the keynote speaker and you put a, a message uh, of support on on Neil's uh, Facebook page, encouraging people to uh, to go down, and it was a really spontaneous uh, event, as the sort of nationalist activist scene had been quiet for some time. Yeah, uh, it was a spontaneous decision on my behalf as well to join in. Uh, Neil did contact me and tell me about it, but he contacts me and tells me about a lot of things. Uh, but this particular um, event that he was hosting, I had a personal interest in because I followed the. Uh, the, uh, the African crime uh, saga in Melbourne for the past couple of years. And because I've seen it firsthand, I know that the, uh, the state prisons in Victoria are all full, including the police station cells, which is uh, a big part of the reason these Africans are released back into the community on bail without being held in custody or, or, or on remand for the serious offences that they are charged with. It's not just a, a, the race card and the get out of jail free because you're a black person uh, sort of situation. It's literally because there's no room for them in state prisons. I know that uh, Port Phillip prison in the last four years, which is one of Victoria's maximum security prisons, had renovations to add, I think an additional 200 beds. But those beds were, uh, those beds were filled almost immediately. And I, I believe either another entirely new prison is under construction or has recently been constructed. Uh, I don't know how many beds that will have, possibly anywhere between 400 and 1,000. Uh, still, I believe this, these, these new beds will, 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 will fill up quite quickly. These new cells will fill up quite quickly. And it's quite a frightening reality if you consider that ranking police officers would be giving orders to their, uh, their underlings, uh, boots on the ground cops, to, to make as few arrests as possible because we have nowhere to put these people. And that's why in Melbourne, when you see Africans running riots in Moomba Festival or just on St Kilda Beach or doing whatever it is they're doing, uh, the police generally do not intervene. And uh, they act as though it's not happening and they just try to make sure that's having as minimal effect on the surrounding community as possible. Uh, almost as if they're just sectioning off the area where the Africans are rioting and then just encouraging them to move on when they're done vandalizing surrounds and, and smashing and grabbing what they can. So, uh, uh, because of that personal interest, I, uh, I felt obliged to, uh, to, to give my support to that rally and I filmed one video that went for about five or six minutes uh, for which I was banned from Facebook. Uh, I, I used a friend's account to upload that video and that friend's account was banned. And uh, I think either just before the rally or just after the rally, that video ended up being deleted by Facebook. Yes. And all it was was a video uh, using several analogies or one main one. Uh, to give examples of uh, how and why the media was detracting from immigrant crime, specifically African crime in Melbourne, uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, allowing, encouraging or, uh, or facilitating any criticism of the equality ideal and of the beautiful, noble society of multiculturalism. You know, so uh, I, uh, I went to the rally and... Uh, basically ended up being the key speaker at the rally. I, I didn't intend for this to happen, but it seems to happen every time I go to a rally. I had a conversation, quite a long conversation with uh, the local sergeant uh, of, of, the, of Victoria Police at St Kilda Police Station. Uh, I made him aware of our intentions, despite uh, what I already said was a gross mi uh, misrepresentation of what the rally was by the media, trying to say that we were stirring up a race riot and trying to start what was essentially a race war against Africans. Uh, I told the police officer that we intended to be in and out as fast as possible, that we wanted to del deliver several speeches to the people who attended and uh, protest peacefully and then leave. I, I thought we'd be out of there within the hour. And uh, the policeman actually admitted, the, the sergeant actually admitted that the, uh, the, the media uh, uh, informing people that it was going to be a race riot or some sort of race war on the, on the streets 
made their job more difficult for them and forced them to deploy more police and use more police resources because it encouraged the wrong type of people to turn up. Um, well, that's what the mainstream media was trying to uh, build it up as, so there's going to be a, a huge uh, race riot uh, there. But it ended up being quite a successful event. There was 500 people there. It was a peaceful it's always peaceful from the, the, the Patriot side. It's the, the Antifa and campaign against racism and fascism. They're the ones that always try to get uh, aggressive. Uh, they were kept at bay, so the police uh, did, their, did their job. Now, the, the media, it dawned on me just during this time just how much the media lies and, and misrepresents. For example, there was that fake Facebook post that apparently Neil Erickson put in a, a non-existent Facebook group. Um, yeah, Cook's Convicts Inner Circles, and they had a comment from you when you're banned uh, from Facebook, but that was put up on even the project. They said that that post was, was real, and even, even though the, the event was peaceful and successful, all they uh, ever focused on the media and the aftermath was the alleged uh, Nazi salutes. Yeah, and it's amusing because I was referred to in uh, the media's coverage of the event as a convicted criminal. However, on the side of the what we understand as a left wing, or uh, what in reality are just uh, brainwashed fake ac academics coming from uh, Marxist student unions in the universities. Among them was uh, a convicted murderer and uh, they had been screaming Nazi at all of the uh, working Australians who attended the peaceful protest purely to have their concerns heard or to, f to find uh, people who, who thought the same as them to share their concerns. Uh, they were on the receiving end of this abuse for so long that eventually a couple of them, I think, threw their arms up uh, uh, satirically yes. in a John Cleese style gesture. Mm. And the media, uh, namely, I think it was uh, ABC, uh, a public broadcaster, but, but privately owned media as well. And what's the difference, really? <laughs> they, they used this as uh, undeniable proof that it was a neo-Nazi rally because a couple of people jokingly threw their arms up in the air to do Nazi suits. I think actually only one of them did it jokingly and the other was actually proven to be a wave. Yes, afterwards. yes, that was the yeah. guy in the red shirt. That was just a photo that was taken out of context. People yeah. that commented online, I saw that guy, he was, he was waving. But what I, what I thought was really interesting about that is uh, a couple of members from the Jewish community actually descended from uh, their benevolent uh, Jewish councils that they, uh, they create and wrote a couple of articles for Fairfax Media denouncing us as anti-Semites, even though Jews weren't mentioned at the rally, yeah. which I thought was really, really interesting. And they tried to draw some sort of connection between us and a group called AR, which had allegedly put swastika posters on an, a Jewish aged care facility, which I don't know anything about. And I'm pretty sure that no one at that rally knew anything about. So uh, the hysteria about about neo-Nazis uh, in this country, in, in, in the state of, Victoria and in the media is is reaching is reaching such levels where it's just becoming ridiculous like uh, basically anybody who uh, has any sort of concern anyone from the white working class Australian community who has any sort of concern for the future of their country if they dare uh, speak a word expressing their concerns they'll generally be associated with neo-nazis and the term neo-nazi doesn't even have a consistent or sensible definition anymore it's just a slander word that's used against any dissident or anyone who's who's uh, who's challenging the system uh, or, or not even challenging the system but just criticizing one policy that the system has taken on whether it's immigration or equality or feminism or, or homosexual votes or whatever it is so uh yeah very very mendacious and intellectually dishonest reporting coming from the press and it's quite obvious and i think the reason uh, a couple of uh, 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 jewish intellectuals felt compelled to write uh, a couple of articles that were published by fairfax is because uh the the left were the white leftists who, who, who we understand as leftists who write for the media were, were being so ridiculous and i think i tweeted about it i said they were they were writing articles like passive aggressive schoolgirls. they weren't even making any sense the only articles which did make sense and which were at least given the uh impression that they had a balance of opinion or were actually articulate enough to read to the end were written by the jews so uh yeah it's it's sometimes i think the leftists get so out of control and so hysteric that uh some of their more uh, benevolent directors need to descend from their upper echelons of their uh, uh fake little committees which only benefit their own clans to uh, to correct things and make sure that people are actually understanding that this is a serious neo-nazi threat
Well, the leftist journal or any journalist on Twitter, if they didn't call it a neo-Nazi rally, they were getting all tweets in the reply saying, hey, you've got to make sure that you call it a neo-Nazi rally. But in reality, if you want to use the, the leftist term, it was actually a multicultural rally. The uh, Vietnamese community uh, came along because they've been affected by African crime and you and Ricky Turner, you happily uh, posed for a photo with the, the yeah. South Vietnamese flag. Yeah, and I don't do that to, to appease the left. I do it simply because this guy was concerned about African crime and affecting his community as well. And contrary to what the media will tell you about me, I actually don't treat anyone differently. Uh, on an individual level, I don't have any problem with anyone of any different race, and I've been very clear about that for, throughout my entire political activity. The idea that I am walking around the street every day just loathing people who are not white merely because they're not white is ridiculous. It's almost comical. Uh, I am only looking at this country from a broad point of view, broad perspective, and I understand that uh, due to the current, current demographic crisis or the, the lack of uh, births in the white Australian community, concurrent with the, uh, the mass immigration coming, uh, coming from China, the Arab world and Africa, it's only a matter of time before our white Australians become a minority in this country. And uh, already the results you can see in many communities that are inundated with immigrants and you can't really find any white people anymore. White people, uh, uh, the, uh, the phenomenon of white flight is, is, is common all around the, uh, the southeast of Melbourne, because where the majority of white people are running to. And population is so dense in those areas now, it's all white people living there, but population is so dense that it's, uh, it's hard to, to get from point A to point B anymore. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I've, I, I never speak to or pose with or, or do anything with members of another race to prove that I'm a supporter yeah. of multiculturalism. Like I just, if they want to speak to me, I, I speak to them. It's like, I, I'm not an appeaser. Like if you get any of these parliamentarians or, uh, or, you know, uh, or so-called academics ever posing with a, a Chinese person or a representative from some different community, whether it's a Sudanese community or or, uh, or some or some Muslim community, they're doing it for political brownie points and, and just to appear as a good, benevolent person. They don't actually care about any of these other uh, ethnic groups that no. use them to their political advantage. But that's the, uh, my my point is, I'm not doing that. Yeah, uh, I wasn't saying mm. that, but it's mm. it's just an interesting thing to to note. Mm. Now, obviously, the uh, political meeting at St Kilda Beach was also notable for uh, Senator Fraser Anning's attendance, and he shook your hand. He's now launching his uh, political party, Fraser Anning's Conservative National Party, where there was the, the recent uh, meeting here of the Melbourne branch, or trying to establish a Melbourne branch, which you attended, Neil Erickson attended, Ricky Turner attended, Tom Sewell attended, and he isn't bothered by uh, associating with, with any of you. He, he, he is the only politician who hasn't tried to appease anyone. What have you made of the, the Fraser Anning phenomena? Well, he recognises that the media political academic class actually represents a minority of what we might call the uh, petty bourgeoisie. They are louder because they have more influence and more money. Uh, however, they certainly don't represent the majority of the working population. Uh, these media bureaucrats and, and government officials and so-called academics, they are often at odds with the majority of the working community, uh, the working class Australia, especially white working class Australia. And I think Senator Fraser Anning understands that. And so he does absolutely nothing to appease these, uh, th this minority of uh, fake intellectual snobs. Uh, he's interested in actually representing uh, the working class of Australia, at least at this point. And uh, I think he's got the guts and the, uh, the, the, uh, the determination to do it. Uh, could work on his speaking skills, uh, but that comes in time. But that's really the only, and he's a humble guy. He would admit that to himself, I know. But uh, other than that, I think he's got what it takes, and uh, he he knows that he doesn't need you don't need the media on your side anymore. No, and you don't need the, these these government bureaucrats. You don't need any of these fake intellectuals and uh, and petty petty bourgeois bureaucrats behind you. Uh, you just need the Australian working people behind you, and that is what uh, Fraser Anning understands, and that is what is motivating him, in my opinion. Because he's asked by the, the mainstream media to repent, repent, uh, uh, apologise for this, make sure you absolve yourself of these sins, and he, he doesn't give any ground at all. No, no as he shouldn't. Mm. And uh, I think he had, he gained like, I've never seen anything like it in Australia, I think he gained like 20,000, close to 20,000 Twitter followers in about two or three days, you know, and, and not even a lot of Australians, I, I don't think, use Twitter. Twitter's a very political platform. 
and uh, I think he's still on a Twitter suspension. Yes, yeah. uh, though Facebook, he's, last time I checked, is over 110,000 uh, mm. Facebook likes. Yeah, well, he's, I suppose, I can only think of one other person who was just as hated and slandered as I am, or, or maybe, you know, at least partially so, and that is Fraser Anning, purely because uh, this is not a fake conservative like your Andrew Boltz, for example, who sit on Sky News and, and, and give their conservative opinions, but in reality are just a wet blanket because at the end of the day, they don't care about what happens to this country. They just take home their nice, comfortable $150,000 a year salary and go home to their house on the hill and watch the country burn slowly from the inside out. Fraser Anning actually understands this and speaks openly of the fake conservatives in the media, uh, which is why I'm always amused to hear uh, our leftists and uh, you know, so-called socialists and Marxists and so forth talk about a right-wing media conspiracy, the right-wing Murdoch media, and Andrew Bolton. Is it Alan Jones Radio? And I'll, I'll name a few others: Chris Kenny, mm. uh, Rita Panahi. Yeah, they were exposed uh, in St Kilda. I mean, they've been writing about an African crime problem, but oh, we didn't, we we didn't mean for people like that to go and mm. hold a a protest about it oh we we didn't mean to enable politicians such as such as Fraser Anning. Oh, we don't like him. Yes, when push comes to shove, they do what they're told. And uh, it's funny because uh, they, they claim to represent uh, conservative uh, national values and the working, you know, the working people and the interests of the basic uh, uh, Australian working class. But then when somebody actually stands up and defies the entire media government establishment and all the fake academics who, uh, who impose all of these policies on the working class without asking them if it's what they want, uh, well, then all of these so-called conservatives join hands with the leftist media bureaucrats and vilify whoever that is, whether it's me or Fraser Anning or somebody else. And it's ridiculous because it's quite obvious to me that people like Andrew Boltz and Rita Panay, is that how you say it? Yeah. They're only allowed to remain in the positions they're in in media to create the illusion that there is at least some balance of opinion. So when you sit on the couch at home and watch television, God forbid, I hope no one does that still. Anyone watching this, don't do it. Don't watch television. But if you, if you unfortunately do, you're led to believe that someone is on TV representing something that you believe at least. So it's not that bad. But like I said, they take home their salary and they don't actually do anything for the country. When somebody stands up and says, I'm truly going to represent the interests of the Australian people. I'm going to put a stop on immigration. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at what's going on in the schools with these safe, uh, safe schools programs and the, the brainwashing of children. We're going to uh, look at you know, fair reporting and what's going on in the media and whatever, whatever these people say, whatever a real representative of the working class says, when someone like that stands up, they all turn on him. They all do what they're told. I think Andrew Bolt himself called me a anti-Semitic thug. And what is his basis for, for that? Where is, where is my anti-Semitism? Where's the verifiable proof? And thuggery? What thuggery? What does thuggery represent? Bullying, violence, standover tactics? When have I been guilty of that since my engagement in politics? I actually asked him to back up his statements and to invite me on his show to back them up. Of course, I didn't get any reply. And that just goes to show that the intellectual honesty of these fake conservatives. And uh, th there is no one in any position of influence or power, especially in the state of Victoria, who represents the interests of the white working, uh, working class Australia. There, are, uh, there is the illusion of representation, but there is no real representation, except with Fraser Anning. And they want his head uh, for defying their rule and for not doing what he's told. Oh, one yeah. boy is aimed at his head. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the egg boy thing. Yeah. Now, obviously, the, the Christchurch uh, mosque uh, shooting where, where 50 uh, Muslims were killed has really shaken up both Australia and New Zealand, and uh, there's been calls for a crackdown on the so-called uh, far-right, extreme right. Now, the shooter was Australian, Brenton Tarrant, so there was immediate, there's been quite an effort to try and uh, link him to people such as yourself. You, Neil Erickson, Sherman Burgess, were all contacted on the Friday saying, oh, do you know him? Uh, did he ever attend any of your things? That was sort of the, the, the first thing that they, they wanted to, to pin this on the, the white nationalists, the, the alt-right, and for a crackdown on so-called hate speech or have more surveillance or whatever they've been lobbying for the, the, the past uh, few years. Yeah, uh, well, I was contacted almost immediately afterwards by a colleague of mine who is somewhat close to some ABC journalists, and he said, just fair warning, they are scouring footage of your rallies in Bendigo right now, trying to find 
footage of Brenton Tarrant at one of these rallies, namely the two largest rallies which really put my name in the map, August 29th and October 10th of uh, 2015. Uh, where we rallied against a MOST development, but actually primarily against uh, local government and local media corruption, which was bullying locals and Bendigo Bank, which had closed down uh, bank accounts of locals who opposed the MOST project in that area. But uh, back on points, it's really appalling that the same censorship, ostracization and vilification of uh, the nationalist community in Australia, which I believe contributed to the formation of Tarrant's radical uh, mindset, uh, their solution for, for this terrorism or the, you know, the, the way of fixing it in the, in the minds of these media bureaucrat psychopaths is to uh, further vilify mm. and ostracize and isolate people in that community, which is only going to produce disa disastrous results. And it's interesting because after an Islamic terror attack, you see Walid on television, Walid Ali or Yasmin Abdel Bagid or some representative from some Islamic council or various different Islamic councils with some paralyzing message of love and it was just a once off and we can't let this be reflective of Islam. Uh, they are, the media can't get them onto television fast enough to share those perspectives. But this time after one single attack, and I'm not gonna deny the severity of the attack and you know, it was, it was, it was quite relentless. Uh, the, the reaction has been quite the opposite. It's been to deplatform, censor and totally vilify everyone from the uh not even from the nationalist community anyone right of center even conservative spokespersons even the fake conservatives have been blamed for it mm. i've even seen a couple of twitter feminists suggesting that there is a correlation between uh uh, uh gym goers male gym goers and and white male terrorism because apparently brenton tarrant was a personal trainer at some point in his life so apparently if you go to a gym and you're a white guy you'll be on asio's watch list too it's been alarming and it, the censorship that has resulted from it and the, uh, the sort of pressure that is being put on, uh, on the, 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 for lack of a better term, right-wing community in Australia is uh, not only relentless, but dangerous in my view. Yeah, Richard Dean Tully, the Greens leader, said that Sky News should be shut down for hate speech. Now, we've or already established that Sky News is pretty watered down conservatism, uh, but the fact that not even despite all of their uh, denials, it's, it's enough for, for them. And yeah, as you mentioned there, that after an Islamic terror attack, there's always government saying we need to do more outreach to disenfranchise youth in the Muslim community. But uh, when it's a, a white nationalist terror attack, the, the, there's not this idea to try, because the, the white working class young males are being alienated, there's, there's not any talk of maybe we need to outreach these people. In fact, we've seen Jordan Peterson, his his books are being banned because apparently that leads to radicalization of young men as well. Yeah, where is the community for, for young white men to go to if they're feeling like they have a problem with uh, any personal matter, whether it's even, even drugs or, or personal relationships or it, it, and when it, become, it comes to politics, where do they go? Like, where, where do they have to go? There was Lad Society recently, mm. but other than that, there isn't anything funded by the government, quite the opposite, the government shuts down and censors anything that is trying to uh, create any sort of support for, for, for young white Australian men. And uh, I am of the opinion that it's deliberate. I think over the past uh, three to four years in the media, it's obvious that uh, uh, a far right white terrorist is exactly what the media has been looking for. Um, they've been talking about the threat of far right terrorism for, for a couple of years now, even though there hasn't really been any far right terrorists. And so, uh, I believe it's in the interests of the media government establishment to, uh, to, f to further alienate young white men and isolate them in conjunction with vilifying and, 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 and uh, slandering them whenever they stand up to, to try to represent uh, their values in the hope that there will be probably more terrorism that they can use to further legislate against basic human rights of Australians. Uh, now, as you already mentioned, they were scouring footage of uh, your rallies to see if they could spot this uh, terrorist, Brent, uh, Brenton Tarrant, and there was an article uh, a few days ago by, by Alex Mann of the ABC, who seems to have an obsession with Australian nationalists. He was the one that did the uh, expose on the, the Lad Society being members of the New South Wales Young Nationals. He apparently was able to find through the archives uh, comments from Brenton Tarrant on UPF 
pages in your videos uh, calling you um, Emperor Blair and that's the, the most that they've been able to link him to the the, the nationalist movement, just a, just a few comments, but it just showed how, how desperate they are. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure Alex Mann, who is uh, funded or employed by Australian Broadcasting Com uh, Company, Corporation, pretty sure he's an anti-fascist activist, or was. However, I've been respectful of him in the past because he actually did some work before he published his article on Lad Society last year. The presence of Lad Society members uh, uh, gaining influence in, I think it was the Young Nationals uh, and, and other networks linked to the Young Nationals and the Liberal Party, was actually a verifiable pr a truth. And he discovered that somehow. And uh, he went to visit the Lad Society Clubhouse in Sydney for comment. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure he rang me for comment. And he did weeks worth of investigation before he actually put out his article instead of just copy and pasting something that some other journalist had written about neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And I actually texted him after that article. I knew he wasn't friendly to me, but I texted him. I said, hey, well done for actually doing some journalism. Uh, I know that you're not friendly to me, but at least you did some investigation in regards to that article. You know, and he was appreciative of my appreciation. But unfortunately, he's exploited this respect I had for him now to interview me recently uh, to try to suggest that there is some link between me and the Christchurch shooter, Brenton Tarrant. No such link exists. However, it's the most bizarre story because they could not find any photo, footage, conversation, anything of Brenton Tarrant and myself, because none exists, they somehow got access to Facebook metadata. I'm not sure what that is. You might be. But I'm pretty sure you've got to go to Facebook staff to get it. And to do that in under a week and to have analysed it and to have to claim to have found through comparison of data differences... Mm. Uh, comments allegedly made by Taryn in support of me is very far reaching. And I actually asked, I sent a text to Alex after I read the article asking what is the process of metadata scraping exactly? Because you don't have screenshots. Yeah. And, and what, what is the actual proof? Why didn't you put the proof in the article? Yeah, he just says, believe us that we've got it, oh, but we can't publish it. Yeah. And I said, what is the process? Is it a, is it a legally recognized process that, that you're engaged in? And obviously I haven't had any reply. But uh, even if it was true that, that, that the Christchurch terrorist uh, made supportive comments of me three years ago, pretty sure after that he traveled to Turkey and lived in Turkey for, and Pakistan for a while and ended up developing this anti-Trump, pro-communist China, accelerationist, eco-fascist uh, philosophy, which is totally complex and I personally don't even really understand it. And then went and shot these people in a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand for some reason, out of all places. And I don't understand why, and I, I don't even really want to understand why. But funnily enough, if you if you now type my name into to Google, you're going to see these uh, these unverifiable and uh, mostly imagined links between me and him, because apparently there is metadata, whatever that is, suggesting that he made supportive comments of me once. Never mind uh, whether that whether that's true or not. But uh, you just have to take their word for it. But uh, it doesn't actually mean anything, and I'm not really worried about it. However, I did consider that uh, there are a lot of angry and uh, probably vengeful Muslims in Melbourne, and uh, the only real result of such an article attempting to draw some link between me and this terrorist uh, could be to, to endanger my personal safety. The, the intent of that article could be to encourage somebody to, uh, to, to violence or even to, to murder me violence against me or murder me and so I've taken that into consideration and I've spoken to my lawyer and uh, we're probably going to, I'm going to contact ABC tomorrow and uh, be in the process of asking them to remove that article uh, or at least uh, publish my response to Alex Mann's uh, idea that apparently my uh, my rallies against a couple of mosque projects and government corruption back in 2015 radicalized Brenton Tarrant somehow I suggested in the phone interview uh, that's actually the uh, the censorship and vilification of uh, members of the nationalist community in Australia probably contributed more uh, that the uh, the treatment of people on the right as we understand it by the media is probably more likely to antagonize people to violence rather than me telling them that there's a government uh, government media uh, corruption sort of conspiracy against the working class Australia uh, of course my perspective was casually omitted from the article but his perspective was put forward so that's very intellectually dishonest, and I can't say that I, I'm um, too wrapped with that. 
it just goes to show that you can't trust anyone in the in the in the mainstream media yeah i've certainly learned that i mean i've had very little directly to do with them but i've just learned through the past six months the the way they they misrepresent things and put their own slant on it it's i'm not i'm not shocked by it uh, anymore hmm. yeah as i said um it's disappointing because uh alex man knew that i would speak to him if he rang me because he knew that after the last article he published i actually did appreciate the fact that he put some work into investigation as i said but uh he exploited that respect that i had for him that small amount of respect just to further defame my character and and probably try to incite violence against me just a, f a further comment on that on the whole ordeal with with the christchurch terrorists i made first a written statement that that kind of terrorism actually plays into the hands of the government media establishment and that it gives them the excuse they need to make further attacks legal attacks and and, and bureaucratic attacks on uh on christian culture in the white australian community which is exactly what they've used that attack to do and uh, that statement if uh if you share that statement by me on facebook your account can be uh, suspended it happened to someone last night and they just sent me the screenshot uh, apparently that statement goes against facebook's community standards that statement i made verbally as well and went into greater detail about how groups who are the victim of terrorism actually benefit from terrorism in the long run and timely enough and i, I said that uh, the islamic community was probably going to get money thrown at it as a result of uh, of that terror attack and then that afternoon after i filmed that video the government gave them 55 million dollars apparently for increased mosque security yes but how they actually use that money of course is entirely up to them the government's not going to scrutinize it so uh that video uh, actually has been limited by youtube and a viewer discretion message appears before you watch it you can't see the amount of views comments you can't comment on it you can't engage with it several videos of me that other people have uploaded on facebook from years ago have uh, have also been limited uh, viewer discretion is advised so basically i as an individual uh, any word that I speak is uh, is now considered offensive or against the standards of these of these platforms, even YouTube. Uh, so um, it's more, as I said, there seems to be an effort to to censor me whenever I start countering the media's message that I'm I'm trying to spread hatred. Okay, as soon as I start speaking sense, as soon as I, I actually identify the media and the government as the source of the problem and their corporate sponsors especially that is when the censorship gets most intense it's not when i uh it's not when i speak out against the islamic community or the african community or any other type of people they're happy for me to do that when i criticize the core of the problem and when i really get down into the essence of what's happening in our country the the level of corruption in the institutions that's that's when i get banned from social media usually uh sure i've said some things that are a little bit uh a little bit abrasive sometimes that have resulted in suspensions but the outright censorship is always the result of identifying the core of the issue and we're seeing at the moment a censorship campaign like never before i mean the the left they've always disliked free speech but now they feel emboldened and they've got the the federal government on their side who are eager to not be seen as as racist and uh, there was obviously scott morrison with waleed ali saying oh, i never said you know anything bad about muslims please please forgive me you were banned from twitter before the christchurch shooting happened neil erickson was banned after you both made accounts on gab.ai which is a free speech uh, twitter uh, alternative and you've already gained close to a thousand uh, followers and but of course the the fact that you're now on another platform is uh, still too much for those on the left there was a Fairfax article saying that you've moved to a shadowy messaging service and the the far-right crackdown perhaps hasn't gone far enough they're very paranoid about me uh, mostly because I am an ideologue uh, for Australian nationalism I am as dogmatic and as determined as they come and uh th there's no deterring me from my belief in australian nationalism and everything i do is going to be a conscientious effort to help the uh the understanding of national consciousness uh be reinvigorated in the uh, australian working class that i believe is my is my purpose and 
They also understand that I have uh, knowledge of general, general psychology, of human psychology and propaganda. I, I know what they know, and I'm perhaps even better at it than they are. And that's why they don't want me speaking at all, uh, especially because I often criticize them and explain exactly what, what they're doing and how they're doing it. And uh, you know, journalists really don't like that, uh, especially big media editors and, and their corporate sponsors. There's nothing they can do about me being on Gab, though, as far as I know. A gab told them to basically go and get nicked. We we support free speech, and they've give, already given you a verification because mm. we should explain your uh, gab handle is real Blair Cottrell, not Blair Cottrell eighty nine, as it was on mm. on Twitter. Yep. But you've got the the tick there, which verifies that it's you. Yeah, my account is the blue tick, and uh, I post on. I've been posting on Gab every day for the last six days or seven days since I made it, and I suppose that's where I'll up operate mostly from. Uh, I don't. I can't imagine I'll last much longer on YouTube if my videos discouraging terrorism are already getting put in limited state. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me for now. But uh, I intend in the near future to host a, to a meeting to reconsolidate uh, the nationalist community in Australia because it seems to uh, it seems to be getting atomized uh, as a result of not not just personal quarrels but uh, but just just lack of unified purpose and clear achievable objectives. And uh, I believe. The, the one value I have in the general community of nationalism in Australia is, uh, is I can bring the various groups together and I can bring people together. Because uh, there's, there's no denying that there's been various uh, divisions over the years in the nationalist uh, community, often uh, very public. But for example, you and Neil Erickson, you went your separate ways after the UPF uh, disbanded, but you, you now have a, a good relationship together and there is this sort of understanding now that, you know, despite the sort of various differences, there there's a maturity coming through. Sure. Uh, I, I, I try to take on certain personality traits or characteristics that I expect a community group f forming around me should should take on. Because any, uh, any movement or group generally uh, only is a reflection or, or sort of an extension of the individual personality who's the main speaker or leader of that group. And one of the principles I take on board is not to scold people and not to focus on individuals or people themselves, but to always focus on a goal, to look beyond what people are doing and to focus always on a goal which is clear and easy, easy, easily observable, easy to achieve, to provide hope. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte said that a leader is a dealer in hope, and I think it's very important that people uh, remain hopeful and remain uh, are reminded that there is still a lot of hope in this country and uh, so i think it's just important to to maintain an ideal of hope and to avoid scolding one another but that's something i'll get into more when when we are when i host my next meeting sure and now one continuing battle you're involved in is your appealing uh, your conviction under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act for conducting the, the mock beheading during the Bendigo Mosque uh, protest. Now, are you and your lawyer, John Bolton, uh, challenging the, the constitutionality of it? The High Court uh, refused to hear it. They've sent you back to the, the County Court. You had a mention uh, a few weeks back where they've agreed to, for it to, to go to trial. Where, where is, are you confident you and John Bolton is that you have a, have a strong case? Uh, my lawyer is very confident. And uh, the, it's not that the High Court refused to hear it. It's that we were mistakenly directed to the High Court by the County Court judge who believed that she did not have the power to hear a constitutional matter. But uh, the state prosecution, desperate to keep the matter from going to the High Court, dug up a piece of legislation which actually asserts that the County Court does have the power to hear a constitutional matter. And so they notified the High Court of that piece of legislation that uh, many High Court judges themselves weren't aware of. And uh, it's, it's now being sent back to the County Court. So the constitutional matter still needs to be heard, meaning the law may still be legally invalid. Uh, but that is for the County Court judge to determine. I believe it will be in August, but I will be back in court for a small mention to ensure that we're ready to go ahead in July. Basically, just so everybody understands what that charge is, it's much more sinister than it seems uh, ostensibly. It's not a charge of hate speech. It's not a charge of offending anyone or inciting anything. The exact wording of the charge is publishing a video to Facebook with intent to incite serious ridicule, revulsion of a specific class of people, namely Muslims. Okay. So I haven't been charged with doing anything wrong, but with intending to do something wrong. Okay. So it is my internal motivation or my thought processes 
which have been deemed illegal by the state. And I am fighting to prove that I did not commit a thought crime before uploading a video to Facebook or participating in a video which was uploaded to Facebook, to use the exact wording the prosecution used in its charge. So uh, <clears throat> very important to understand that the, uh, the charge that I'm battling is not a charge for doing anything wrong, but for thinking something wrong, which is why it's so important for me to, to defeat that charge in my, in my, in my view. If it, if it goes through and the prosecution gets what they want, uh, I don't set a precedent for, for, for a legal defense against that charge. Well, then your, uh, your intent before you post things to Facebook, uh, can be deemed criminal regardless of what it is you post that the government can say you had bad intentions before you posted that you've committed an offense you're going to court which is pretty profound when you consider the the, the reality of that yeah, yeah definitely and yeah to this stage it's just been toing and froing uh between courts do you feel that there's uh, they're they're trying to frustrate you and obviously the legal uh, system is expensive and uh, during this time you've been you used PayPal to um, solicit uh, legal funds but you were also deplatformed from PayPal mm, probably for that purpose but uh, it's a total farce basically what we're doing at court is not necessarily defending ourselves against this charge is determining whether or not we can still even defend ourselves against any charge are there any judges that aren't in the pocket of the state we'll find out uh it's possible that there is some good judges still left members of the judiciary which still believe in the proper course of justice and it's possible that all of them are corrupt well, we're going to find out because if this charge goes through it only proves that they're all in the pocket of the state and there's no point ever going to court for any purpose if you're a dissident yeah and i've certainly looked at your your case on paper and the the case is strong but it just seems like they don't want to decide that's what appears they don't want to decide in your favor they're sort of trying to defer that they're doing everything possible to delay and defer i think in the meantime there may be an effort to uh to ensure that a specific judge hears the matter a judge that they they are confident will rule in their favor probably for personal reasons uh, maybe maybe the judge has some sort of preconceived ideological bias or maybe they're just all part of some some network some underground network we don't know about but that's uh, Alex Jones level stuff. <laughs> You'll have to go to InfoWars if you want to hear more about that. Mm. Well, we'll certainly be following uh, your case closely. It's been good to, to catch up today. I encourage everyone to follow Blair on Gab and also The Unshackled is on Gab as well. Support free speech. We'll keep following uh, your work and uh, thanks for talking to us today. And yeah, we, uh, for the record, won't be uh, cucking <laughs> unlike others. Thanks, mate. Good on you. And that's the show for today. I hope this episode was an enlightening one, not just for our followers, but others who come across it who want to learn more about Blair Cottrell. This episode is airing on a Monday night. The ABC's Four Corners program tonight has an episode under the radar about how the Christchurch killer Brenton Tarrant was able to stay off the authorities' radar, and most likely we'll conclude that there needs to be more surveillance of far-right or nationalist activists, so I'll have more to say about that once it has been aired. After that, stay tuned for XYZ Live at 9.15 Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time with Maddie Rose and David Hiscock. And I'm also pleased to announce that this Thursday at around 8.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, The Unshackled, XYZ and The Rational Rise are launching a brand new live show, The Uncuckables, where we will discuss the issues of the week in a no off-limits format. It is important in this age of media cucking that all of us in the alt media stick together, so we are very excited about this new project. As discussed throughout the show, there's been an explosion in interest in Gab.ai, but uh, we are also on Minds.com, which is another free speech social media alternative, which you should also all get onto. As I state at the end of every show, The Unshackled can only continue to work and continue its mission to bring you shows like today with the financial support of our followers. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled or directly via PayPal me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership in case those two previous crowdfunding sources decide they don't like us anymore. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.